early 1980s, we were shocked and amazed by games that included recorded speech. Another visitor. Stay a while. Stay forever. Ghostbusters! <laughs> Keep in mind that computers from that time period did not have audio inputs. Uh, that didn't really become commonplace until the 1990s. So today we're going to have a look at a few products that came out in the mid-1980s that allowed you to sample sounds from the real world into your computer. Uh, one of those is the uh, sound sampler made by Commodore, and another one is the Kovax Voice Master. And uh, I have two versions here. This one is the Commodore 64 version, and I also have an Apple II version. So we're going to take a look at all three of these. So the Sound Sampler is the first product we're going to try out. Now this came out in 1985, and this is a UK version that was donated to me a while back. Let's open it up and have a look inside. We get a thin manual, and the software comes on cassette. Which makes sense, because in that time most everyone in the UK was still using cassettes. However, I went online and found the software on disk and created my own as that will be more convenient for me. Here's the actual cartridge. Uh, it has an input volume and a feedback control. On the side it has two RCA jacks for input and output. And of course it plugs into the cartridge board of the Commodore 64. And it has a pass-through port so you can leave this cartridge connected while still being able to use other cartridges. It comes with a little microphone and since it doesn't have the correct connector on the end they've included a little converter for you. As you can see, the ports are labeled on the bottom, uh, so this would go here, and then they've given you this, and don't feel bad if you're puzzled as to what this is. Um, it actually plugs into the monitor port on your C64, and I'll explain that in a little bit. If you think this cartridge looks familiar, it's probably because it highly resembles the sound expander which gives FM synthesis to your C64, and of course the Commodore Magic Voice cartridge which is a speech synthesizer. Uh, these all share a common case design and all have to do with sound as well. So what we'll do is plug this in here and the audio output connects to the monitor output. Now the reason for this is there's actually an audio input on that same jack. Of course you can't record from that, it's just a pass through, but uh, since most people back in the day would be using an RF connection like this to their television, which carries both audio and video on the same cable, this was a convenient way to mix the audio with the C64's built in sound. Of course in my case I'm using a real monitor so I need that port open, so what I'll do is I'll just uh, plug the sound cable in here and then run that back around of my monitor. And uh, I'll unplug the C64 audio temporarily. That just means I won't be able to hear anything from the SID chip, but that's okay. We won't be using it for this example. Okay, and uh, I'm ready to power it on and, of course, load up the software. So this software is menu-driven, which, uh, to be honest, was not common in 1985. Uh, but notice that they want you to use the function keys for cursor keys, and that's probably because they knew the average consumer would be confused by Commodore's weird cursor keys. Anyway, so let's record our first voice sample. Uh, I'll need to check the input volume by watching the meter on the screen. Testing, 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 testing. Okay, so let's record something. Hey Techmoan, what do you think of this audio format? Once the sound is recorded, there are a number of things you can do, such as examine the waveforms, etc. Uh, to play back, it's actually designed to use the incredible musical keyboard attachment. However, my Breadman C64 isn't working right now, so all I have is the 64C. Trouble is, the musical keyboard doesn't fit the 64C, so uh, I'll just make do without it. So let's record something more interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's hear this backwards. You can also define a section of the waveform to use as an infinite loop. So in this regard, it works kind of like an old Casio SK series sampling keyboard. Okay, so let's try out the echo feature. I'm gonna set it to 0.1 seconds. Hey, listen to this. It's like an echo, just like social media. <laughs> let's try a little bit longer. Let's see what that sounds like. Okay, here's another test. Okay. 
Wow, sounds like something from science fiction. And I figure you'll want to see what's in the inside of this thing. Now, despite being a cartridge, it has no actual ROM chips. Uh, it looks like the heart of this product is the analog digital converter right here. Okay, let's have a look at the Kovacs Voice Master. Now, this particular product was actually sold for several different computers, including the Commodore, uh, Apple II, and Atari. Uh, this box, however, does not actually say anywhere on it which platform that it's uh, marketed for. Um, now, I happen to know this is the Commodore 64 version. It is possible that maybe when it was uh, shrink-wrapped, there might have been a sticker or something on it that said Commodore, but the box itself uh, does just simply does not say. <laughs> I've actually never played with one of these before, but I'm, I remember seeing it in the Commodore Buyer's Guide that I must have read through a hundred times when I was a kid. So I was always fascinated by the device. It's nice having the original boxes for these things so we can see exactly how it was packaged. There are actually three or four different manuals included uh, that deal with the various programs that come on the disc. Speaking of, here it is. Uh, interesting that they printed these labels with a dot matrix printer. Anyway, uh, here we go. This version of the software came out in November of 1987. And one interesting thing is how white this product is. I mean, if you compare it to my Apple II version, there is quite a contrast. Uh, speaking of, you might actually be asking, what's the difference between these since they look identical? Now, well, the main difference is the cable end. Uh, the Apple IIc version is male and the Commodore version is female. In fact, you could actually connect these together if you wanted, not that it does any good. Um, however, the insides are completely different. I don't honestly know if this difference is down to Commodore versus Apple implementation, or maybe one board is an earlier revision than the other. Anyway, back to unboxing. Um, it comes with this very 80s looking microphone headset. Yeah, this is a very 1980s style headset. Uh, I haven't worn anything like this in quite some time. Yeah, there we go. Now, this is kind of flimsy here, but uh, yeah. Very 1980s. <laughs> you also get a couple of other cables. Uh, these are pass-through cables, uh, which will take the audio from the computer and pass it through to your headset speaker. But these are optional, as you can just listen to the audio through the speaker in your TV or monitor. And here's something odd in the bottom of the box. Genuine Kovax Adjust Tool. This looks like somebody just cut the handle off of a fork or something. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is a joke from the previous owner or if this really came from the factory. Anyway, the idea is there's a little potentiometer recessed in the box and this fits in there and can turn it. Anyway, uh, let's connect this thing up. The microphone is red and the speaker is black and uh, this part just plugs in joystick port two and we'll need the disc. Upon starting the software, you get this menu, and as you can see, there are a number of activities you can do with your voice master. Now, the first thing I'll do is calibrate mine, and sure enough, step number three actually references the official Kovacs adjustment tool, so <laughs> I guess that's really a thing. Okay, so let's do a little test here. I'm going to push F1. This is a test of the Kovacs voice master, one, two, three. Okay, now we're going to push F3 to play it back. Okay, definitely not the best audio quality I've heard. So now I want to show you something crazy. So apparently the software is not smart enough to stop the recording when it runs out of memory. So watch this. Okay, I'm just going to keep on talking here until the computer runs out of memory. Now, you'd think the program would be smart enough to stop itself, but unfortunately, it's not. Now, I'm just going to keep talking here, and eventually, come on, there we go. Yep, computer just crashes. I've seen it crash in a number of different ways, but yeah, it's somebody didn't think this through too well. Okay, so here's the Spectrum display. So, um, yeah, works pretty much like you'd expect. It does sort of, at least it measures the amplitude pretty well. I'm not so sure on the actual spectrum. Okay, so what about speech recognition? It has a demo program here. Uh, first, you do have to train it to your speech. Kovax. Voice master. Computer. Finish. Okay, so the idea is it's supposed to recognize when I say one of those words. Voice master. Computer. Finish. 
So, I mean, yeah, that actually works decently well, considering the era of technology that we're talking about here. Okay, so there's also a game of blackjack that you can play. Now, playing blackjack on a computer is nothing new, but what this program does is it allows you to play it more or less by voice command only. Okay, here we go. Cards. Cards. One, three, bet. Hit me. Menu. Okay, so it sort of kind of works, but it'd be an awful way to actually play this game. <laughs> Now, we're going to try the Hum Along program, also known as the Voice Harp. So, uh, what this program is supposed to do is allow you to hum or whistle into the microphone, and it'll find the frequency and play that as a regular computerized tone on the SID chip. But the question is, how well does it work? Okay. So, unfortunately, the sound from the monitor uh, actually gets picked up by the, the headset, and it's kind of like this... Uh, you know, infinite loop. So um, what we wanted, I've got the volume turned down on the monitor right now, and I'm going to turn it up hopefully just enough that you can hear both me and the um, the computer. La, 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 la. Da, 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 da. So the problem is, is that there's a bit of a delay between the time I make the sound and the time the computer responds, and it's extremely disorienting if you're trying to sing. Not only that, but I'm not really uh, a, a good singer. I don't really can't sing on key, so let's try somebody that can. Okay, uh, my daughter has agreed to sing for me, and uh, what I'm going to do is record the sound from the computer directly into the Zoom recorder. Uh, that way we won't hear it uh, during the recording. Uh, then we can see how closely it resembles what she sings. What goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor falls, and the major lifts, the baffled king composing, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Okay, so I'm going to have to say that the voice harp is pretty useless. I think it's more or less just a gimmick. And I don't think anybody could do anything particularly useful with it. So uh, let's move on and play around with the composer. Uh, now this software is supposed to allow you to hum or whistle a tune, and it will translate that into musical score. So uh, at the menu here, we'll select record. La, la, la. La la, do, 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 do. <laughs> so one problem I noticed right away is that it doesn't really take tempo into account very well. I mean, it sort of does, but it's it's just not really working properly. Um, you'll see what I'm talking about. So we're going to play back what I just recorded. Okay, actually, I don't even think most of those notes were correct, and even if they were, the tempo being totally off just, just totally screws it up. But again, let's try it with somebody who um, has a little bit better voice than me. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. Okay, uh, since that didn't work all that well, let's try cheating by using something that has perfect pitch. That was a C major scale, so most of these notes are correct, but it identified the wrong octave for most of them. And thus, uh, when you play it back, it sounds nonsensical. I think it's safe to say that the uh, musical capabilities of the Kovacs are pretty useless. 
Um, the software also includes some other speech related programs, but these don't actually require the Kovax hardware to work. Uh, for example, there's a talking clock program. The time is 3.24 p.m. There's also a talking calculator program that works in English or Spanish. Four, two, times two, three. So I was curious how this thing worked and uh, wanted to tone out which pins of the joystick port it actually connects to. I was somewhat surprised at what I discovered, um, so I pretty much figured it would connect to 5 volts and ground, and it does, uh, no surprise there, but um, I was curious if it used the digital I.O. pins of the joystick or the analog inputs of the paddles. Well, it turns out it connects to both. Um, the only pin it doesn't use is the joystick button on pin 6. So I wrote a little program in BASIC to monitor the data on the various registers that it would be uh, coming in over, but unfortunately I never saw any change on these when talking into it, so I'm obviously missing something. Oh well. Okay, time to try out the Apple IIc version. Uh, it plugs into the special joystick port on the Apple IIc, although it might work on the 2GS which has the same connector. Anyway, uh, let's give it a shot. By the way, finding the software for this was tough. Uh, thankfully, somebody on the Apple II Facebook group uh, uploaded a copy for me, so here it is. I'll use the same headset from the Commodore version as it's the only one I have. So it appears it is loading a version that is customized for the Apple IIc. And we get the same little intro voice as on the Commodore version. And the menu looks pretty similar to the one on the Commodore. Most of the same features. Uh, let's try making a recording. Okay, so this is a test of the Apple IIc version. Okay, let's play that back. Okay. Well, here's the uh, little spectrum analyzer again. Uh, very similar to the Commodore version, only there's no color. So there's no voice harp on the Apple II for obvious reasons, it has no dedicated sound chip, but it does have the composer, so I'm going to do the same test here with the keyboard. And I think it works about as crappy as the Commodore version, uh, so let's play that back. Yeah, well, um, I did notice there was a demo file on the disc called Vivaldi, so presumably somebody at Kovox made this, uh, let's give it a try. Um, I have no comment on that. The Apple II has a bit different speech recognition program. Uh, this is just a proof of concept. Uh, it runs in 80 columns mode. Uh, this program doesn't actually do anything other than let you test menu options. File. Attribute. Edit. Paragraph. Fix. Resolution. Okay, that works pretty well. The Apple IIc version also has the same clock and calculator programs. But now I'm kind of curious if this will run on a Laser 128, since it does have that same joystick port that the 2C has. Now one thing it does differently is it asks if I have a Sound Master. Now keep in mind that's a different product from the Voice Master. Anyway, we don't, so I'll say no. And this is interesting, it has actually detected that it's running on a Laser 128. So the folks at uh, Kovox actually took the Laser into account when designing this. Anyway, I'll do a quick test to see if it really works. Testing on the Laser 128. Testing on the Laser 128. Well, I guess it works. Okay, so unfortunately these products are just maybe a little bit disappointing to me as far as what they're able to do. Some of the things they do pretty well, like speech recognition that was never really fully utilized, but the actual sampling quality was pretty poor and the sampling length, of course, is pretty poor. And of course that was probably mostly to do with the limitation of RAM on these computers. Nevertheless, uh, when I had my Commodore 64 as a kid, I would have probably loved to play with this just, you know, as a toy. I mean, I, I would have probably spent hours um, playing around with it. So it would have had some entertainment value. That being said, I want to tell you a funny story. So um, I had an Amiga 500 when I was maybe 16, 17, 
and I got a sound sampler for it. I don't even remember which one it was, but it plugged into the parallel port. And one of the things I noticed that it could do is it could record pretty long samples because, you know, the Amiga had a lot more RAM and the samples were much more high fidelity than what you've seen on these products. And one of the things I noticed is it had the ability to reverse audio. So there was this episode of Doctor Who that came out uh, in the 70s, but, uh, you know, I'd seen it recently on a rerun. And the Doctor was talking to the Master through the TARDIS system, but he had to speak backward. Yes, you can hear not that thing. And Joe was very perplexed by this. And so I got the idea to take the VHS tape I had of that, pull it into my Amiga 500, and then reverse it so I could hear what he was saying. And unfortunately, I was pretty disappointed because it turns out he was quite literally just saying gibberish. Yes. I thought maybe they had reversed the clip, um, you know, in the actual audio. Maybe he was really saying something, but but he wasn't. But not too long after that, this episode of Red Dwarf came out called Backwards. And it was kind of the same thing. There was a lot of things in this episode where people were talking backwards and doing things backwards and whatnot. So I recorded several of these clips and I was not disappointed uh, when I played that one backwards. Um, it, it, take a listen. I'm addressing the one prat in the country who's bothered to get hold of this recording, turn it round and actually work out the rubbish that I'm saying. What so yeah, um, I think it aired in the UK first and then aired in the, U uh, in the USA later. So I was probably one of the very first people in the USA to actually hear what the guy was really saying. So uh, I felt pretty proud of myself and I was really surprised at the message that they left there for me. Um, anyway, um, I guess this wraps it up for the sound samplers. Uh, there's actually quite a few more of these out there. And as I accumulate them, I might do another follow-up video later uh, showing some different sound samplers. But uh, that's all for this one. So uh, thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.